Okay, guys, so, ooh, I got much more time left. Good. So um, I had to delete some things off my phone. So we just established that uh, fake peace is the first half of the tribulation period, right? I wanted to point out another thing. It talks about the woman in the wilderness, right? In the book of Revelation where it says the woman flees from the face of the serpent. She goes to the wilderness where she's nourished for 1,260 days, which is three and a half years. So I, I don't know how how God can say it any clearer. The tribulation is three and a half years. And um, the, the time of the Antichrist is 42 months overlaps with this time. Remember, the woman is fleeing from the Antichrist. So these time periods are overlapping. So we've got the 42 months of the Antichrist reigning his terror. We've got 1,260 days of the woman being nourished. We also have 1,260 days of the two witnesses. Right? Two witnesses. They are witnessing to Israel. <laughs> right? With the 144,000. We're not going to get too deep into that. So these time frames all are on the se second half. They overlap. And you want to look for proof text. I'm doing this with one hand, so forgive me if this is all combobulated. This time frame, we know it coincides with the 42 months of the AC's terror. Because it tells us that when the power of the holy people are shattered, holy people are not the church. It's not the church, not Christians and saints from the church. The, this is the two witnesses that will be in Jerusalem. Think geograph, geographically people, right? Jerusalem. All these events are going down in Jerusalem. The AC, the Antichrist, he desecrates the temple in Jerusalem. The two witnesses are in Jerusalem. We know this because when they die, it tells us exactly where they die. Where our Savior died, outside the city of Jerusalem, right? So this is in the Middle East, in Israel, guys. It is in Israel. We got to be careful that we don't read the church into passages and scriptures that are not about the church. It's all connected, but we got to keep things in their proper place, right? In the appropriate place in order to get the right understanding. So it says, when the power of the holy people is shattered... Then all these things will be finished at the end. Jesus returns at the end. Once the two witnesses are killed, once the AC's 42 months is up, his time is up. Jesus comes down and he handles business. He's on his white horse. He's here to fight now. He's gathered the church. They're safely in heaven. Now he's down here to fight at the very end right here. This piece takes another video. We will come back to that. So what we did, what did we just say? We said the fake piece, right? So let's go to Daniel 11 and let's look for a proof text. I'm not just talking out the side of my neck, right? So in Daniel 11, let's go to verse 21. And it reads, if you see an ant, don't worry. I'm next to the window. So we get ants over here sometimes. So it says, in his place, a despised person will rise. Royal honors will not be given to him, but he will come during a time of peace. Some translations might say he come, might, might read he comes um, without warning. Whatever. It means a surprise. The point is, it's to say everyone is going on merry and happy and things are great. It's a time of peace. It's merry time, right? Um, so if, if he's coming, it's without warning, right? Peace. Either way, it doesn't matter. To me, it's the same thing. He, and he seizes the kingdom with intrigue. Not war yet. Not a battle yet. But it says intrigue. 
And the way I understand that is you think of the old days, and, and this happens even today, where you've got these this wheeling and dealing and backhanded deals happening amongst our leaders. And they're bri and they're taking bribes and they're making promises and they're cutting deals. That is how you come to power during a time of intrigue. All right, I had to move outside because the girls are out here. All right, so we just established that he comes during a time of peace. <clears throat> then if we go and keep reading and it says, a flood of forces will be swept before him, away before him. They will be broken as well as the covenant prince. Who is this covenant prince? We're going to come back to that. I have an idea of who I think the covenant prince is. It's not Jesus. <laughs> um, because it says, this person will be broken. Jesus, when he comes, he's coming to break. He's not going to be broken by anybody. <laughs> he's coming to destroy and no one will defeat him. So we know this isn't Jesus. Um, after an alliance is made with him, him being the antichrist. Right? Let's read that again. A flood of forces will be swept away before him. Talking about the Antichrist. They will be broken. As well as the covenant prince. After an alliance is made with him, he will act deceitfully. Could this alliance be the ten nation alliance? Hmm? The ten horned king beast? Remember? They make an agreement with the Antichrist to give their power over to him. Right? Right? Then it says he will rise to power with a small nation during a time of peace. He will come into the richest part of the province and do whatever his fathers and predecessors did. He will lavish plunder, loot, and wealth on his followers, and he will make plans against fortified cities, but only for a time. Now, I believe here a time is only a year, but I'm, I'm digress. I'm not going to get into that piece. With a large army, he will stir up his power and his and his courage against the king of the south, right? The king of the north is the Antichrist, the king of the south. Some think this is Saudi Arabia. We won't get into that. That's for another video. <coughs> the king of the south will prepare for battle with an extremely large and powerful army, but he will not succeed because plots will be made against him. Those who eat provisions at his table will destroy him. <coughs> Excuse me, guys. <clears throat> I'm battling a cold. His army will be swept away and many will fall slain. The two kings, the kings of the north and the south, whose hearts are bent on evil will speak lies at the same table, but to no avail. For still the end will come at the appointed time. The king of the north will return to his land with great wealth. <clears throat> but his heart will be set against the holy covenant. What is this holy covenant, right? The holy covenant is not the church. Let me repeat that. It is not the church. We are in Daniel. This is a prophecy to Daniel about Daniel's people. Daniel is a Jew. He is not a Christian Jew at this point in time in history. We got to make sure we keep those timelines in our mind as we're reading and considering scripture. I do concede that there are some prophecies that have dual meaning that have um, that apply to Israel and could potentially apply to the church. But this is not one. <laughs> OK, this is not one of them. So if this is not about Christians, then there's only one other covenant. It is the Old Testament covenant. And for another video, I'll have to get into this. But listen. Just because Jesus brings in the new covenant, it doesn't mean that the old covenant has been eradicated. Jesus fulfilled it, but he didn't uh, eradicate it. It still exists because by default, when Israel rejects the Messiah, that means they're still a slave to the Old Testament covenant and they're still bound by it. That's what that means. And they're a slave to it. There's freedom in the new covenant, but you're a slave to the old covenant, right? Right. Okay. And I think that's made clear with the analogy when it talked about Sarah and Hagar. Sarah was likened to the new covenant, whereas Hagar, the slave, was likened to the old covenant. And her children would be the Jews or the Israelites. And Sarah's children 
will be those that are free. That would be Christians, okay? So now it says, it says here, um, at the appointed time, he will come again to the south, but his time will not be like the first. Ships of Kittim will come against him, and being intimidated, he will withdraw. Then he will rage against the holy covenant and take action. On his return, he will favor those who abandon the holy covenant. When it talks about the great apostasy and those apostates, it is my belief that it's not a Christian apostasy that we're looking for, right? Because when when Paul is teaching us about, remember he says, you know, the people are concerned that the tribulations already came. They've missed the rapture. And what, what, wait, Paul's like, wait a minute, wait a minute. I already told y'all what has to happen first. Remember, I'm paraphrasing here, guys. He says, one, first of all, there has to be a falling away, an apostasy. And then he says, two, there has to be a, rev a, 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 a revelation or the man of sin has to be revealed, right? Well, the man of sin is revealed in Jerusalem when he desecrates the temple. That's the only evidence we'll know that this particular man is in fact the man of sin because he desecrates the temple and he sets up the abomination of desolation in the place where it should not be set. Remember, it can't be any old man. It has to be this particular man doing this particular deed, which makes him the man of sin, right? Right. So if we know that the desecration happens in Jerusalem, that means this apostasy, if it's coupled with that, has to be in the same region. It can't just be anywhere in the world. It has to be someplace that we can look to and that we don't have to guess about where it might be. It just makes sense that it will be in the same region happening with that same event. So I believe that this apostasy is not a Christian apostasy, but an apostasy of this holy covenant, the law, right? And in another type of translation, it says that he look, it says that he flatters with flattery. He um, seduces uh, uh, men or people who abandon the covenant. Same concept. They leave the covenant. They are apostates. It means to forsake a belief system or a political system that you once believed in, that you once believed in. So they had to have one time been a part of the covenant and then they walked away from it. Okay. So it says he will favor those who abandon the holy covenant. His forces will rise up and desecrate the temple fortress. We have one and two. We have the apostasy and the desecration happening in the same event. The desecration is what marks officially who the man of sin is. He abolishes the regular sacrifice and sets up the abomination of desolation. With flattery, he will corrupt those who wickedly, who act wickedly toward the covenant. These are the apostates. But the people who know their God will be strong and take action. This could be the two witnesses in the 144,000 when it talks to these particular people. Those who have insight among the people will give understanding to many, yet they will fall by the sword and flame and be captured and plundered for a time. I believe a time is a year. Right? When they fall, they will be helped by some, but many others will join them in sincerely. Okay, I believe this group is a combination of what it says when the when the power of the holy people are shattered. This is what that is referring to, in my humble opinion. OK. And we know this is the AC because it says then the king will do whatever he wants. He will exalt himself, magnify himself above every God. He will say outrageous things against God of gods. He will he will be successful until the time of wrath is completed because. What has been decreed will be accomplished. Right. All right. He will magnify himself above all. Instead, he will honor a God of fortresses, a God his fathers did not know. Okay. All righty. 
There's just another point how we know this is the man of sense is that he will greatly honor those who acknowledge him, making them rulers over many and distributing land as a reward. This particular land that's being distributed is Jerusalem. And there's another passage in another book. It might be in Psalms. I don't remember. It could be in Isaiah. I'd have to search that one up. But um, God talks about he's giving judgment and he's talking to a group that he's judging. And he tells them, how dare you divide up my land? He said, it's my my land that you, you, you've you divided up and you've given to other nations, right? It's referring to this. Antichrist, when he comes in and he ransacks Jerusalem, he captures the city. He's going to be in control of the city for three and a half years and he's going to wreak havoc on it. There will be fighting. There will be a battle. There will be persecution. But he will be in control of the city for three and a half years. Only for a short while. He's got 42 months to reign terror. And during that time, he will exile some of the people. Some will be in prison. Some will be murdered, beheaded. And some will go into hiding in the wilderness, in the clefts of the rock, right? Some people believe that to be Petra. That's for another discussion. Um... We know that when he does that, he's going to divide up the land amongst, amongst his friends, right? Let's go to Psalms really quickly. There's another passage um, I wanted to hit on really quickly. Psalms, I think it's 55 or 54. We'll get there and we'll, we'll figure this out. I'm very good at paraphrasing scriptures. I can quote some, but I can find just about anything. I memorize scriptures um, in pieces and parts and um, I Google them the pieces that I remember and then I can get the passage that way don't think you have to memorize all this stuff you just need to know how to paraphrase a good portion of it and then search engines can help you with the rest okay these are just so many scriptures to memorize um, so it talks about this this and okay it's 55 guys Psalms 55 portrayal of a friend and although I, I do I do find these headings helpful, just remember these headings in your Bible are not scriptural. They are placed there by people who have given their opinion on what they think the text means. And most of the time it's right, but some of the times it's completely wrong, okay? Remember, these headings are not scriptural. They are added in to help us. <laughs> All right. So now, let's just let's just re let's just read it all. That way we get the context, all right? Um, and I've got some time here. God, listen to my prayer and do not hide from my plea for help. Pay attention to me and answer me. I am restless and in turmoil with my complaint because the enemies, because of the enemy's words, because of the pressure of the wicked, for they bring down disaster on me and harass me in anger. My heart shudders within me. Terrors of death sweep over me. Fear and trembling grip me. Horror has overwhelmed me. I said, if only I had wings like a dove, I would fly away and find rest. Now, just, just what we've read so far, this is a hard time. This is a bad time. This person is going through something terrifying, something bad, right? How far away I would flee. I would stay in the wilderness. I would hurry to my shelter from the raging wind and the storm. Raging wind and the storm. Is this person just in a storm? Do we think that? Remember, there's a passages that says the nations rage. Armies are likened to floods as they're likened to storms. Raging wind, right? So I believe these are like, um, how can I explain it? A metaphor for armies. But... I'd have to show you more scriptures on that, and I could, but I'm not going to do it right now because I'm at the point of this video. All right. Lord, confuse and confound their speech, for I see violence and strife in the city. What city? Jerusalem. Day and night they make the rounds on its walls. Crime and trouble are within it. Sounds like the tribulation period to me. Destruction is inside it. Oppression and deceit never leave its marketplaces. Now it is not an enemy who insults me. Otherwise, I could bear it. It is not a foe who rises up against me. Otherwise, I could hide from it. But it is you, a man who is my peer, 
my companion, which means friend, a good friend. We used to have close fellowship. We walked with the crowd into the house of God, which is the temple. Let death take them by surprise. Let them go down to shell alive because evil is in their homes and within them. But I call to God and the Lord will save me. I complain and groan morning, noon and night and he hears my voice. Though many are against me, he will redeem me from my battle unharmed. But the one enthroned from long ago will hear and will humiliate them because they do not change and do not fear God. My friend acts violently against those at peace with him. Didn't we just read that the Antichrist comes to power during a time of peace? Didn't we just talk about fake peace? He signs the treaty at the beginning of the week. Then he breaks it in the middle of the week. Well, what happens during that time? He puts on his fake facade of peace. He, he, and Han, knowing he has a plan to break his promise in the middle of the week, okay? He violates his covenant. That means his agreement. His buttery words are smooth, but war is in his heart. His words are softer than oil, but they are drawn swords, okay? You can read the rest, all right? So guys, that is the man of sin, right? He is the friend of whoever this person is. So this is who I believe the prince of the covenant is, this person. The writer of this is seeing a vision and the prince of the covenant is the friend of the AC who betrays him. It says here, he violates his covenant. Covenant simply means agreement. Scripture makes clear when it's talking about an agreement, whether it's just a regular old agreement or if it's the law. And by saying holy covenant, we know it's talking about the law. Here it just says covenant, which means his agreement, which we know the Antichrist, according to Daniel, signs at the beginning of the week. But if you don't believe me, we can definitely go back there, okay? Um, I want to get to one other point 